pray and we'll ask the Lord to uh, bless those and bless the, um, the lesson tonight as well. Anybody got any needs tonight that maybe we're not called out this morning or any updates? Starting a new job, um, still with regions, something different though, and um, just pray that it goes okay. I, I, I don't really like change and learning new stuff, but it's, it's got to happen. So um, I pray that it goes smoothly as, as can, can be. I know our kids start school work and school tomorrow, so y'all y'all remember them as well. Remember their teacher. <laughs> <laughs> serious than others, but in God's eyes, are, uh, He's willing to touch all of them, and um, uh, let's, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you uh, for allowing us tonight, Lord, to be able to share our needs, share our problems, our thoughts, our concerns that are going on in our lives or maybe in our family's lives. You've heard each and every one that's been called out uh, tonight and this morning. God, you know the, the situation that's in people's lives for Brandon tonight, we lift him up, you know, the situation that he's in, the things that he's facing and going through, God, and we know that uh, there is a plan and a purpose uh, that you can work out in everyone's life, God, and I pray, Lord, that you use this situation uh, in a way that uh, would draw him closer to you, God, be with him and his family, uh, the concerns of everyone that uh, is concerned over him tonight, Lord, just touch them and help them. Um, God, for uh, Miss uh, Glenda's son, Lord, as, as he's uh, working where he is and the things that he's going through, God, protect him, protect his family, watch over them, and each and everything that, that's going on, not just there, but across America tonight, you know, the needs and the, uh, the problems that are going on in people's lives, God, and, and what this nation is facing, facing, God, we ask you, Lord, for help and for guidance. Lord, that we as Christians might stand firm in your word, that we do exactly what you've called us to do. God, we ask you to be with the kids tonight, lift them up as they start school this week. Be with Shane, Lord, the uh, situation that he's in and the things that he is praying about. And 
I, I know uh, this, the situation with his job and things like that, that he's been concerned over. God, work everything out for your honor, for your glory, for the ones that were here this morning uh, that uh, maybe were in need. I pray, God, that you just bless them and, and encourage them. For the ones that haven't been here today, Lord, you know the uh, things that are going on in their life. And I pray, Lord, that you just touch them and be with them. Thank you again for this time that you're going to allow us tonight to be able to study your word, to be able to study this lesson. Bring something out that would be a, a blessing in our hearts, that would encourage us and lift us up. Go with us now as we begin this lesson. Uh, carry us just through this week. God, may we be a blessing and a, a shining light to this world because of the things that you've blessed us with. We love you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we are on page 32. Uh, it's considered day four. Um, I, I'm sure everybody uh, has their book tonight except for Cole. Uh, she went off and, and left that tonight. Um, so she is uh, not able to help. She asked about getting up here maybe reading. So I might, just for the fun of it, get her up here to read. So. Uh, <laughs> But uh, tonight is, uh, we're going a little bit further, beginning to talk a little bit more about Elijah, kind of getting into a, a um, what you would, would, would consider kind of leading up to, to his, um, what, if, if you want to kind of climax in, in his, um, um, I, I guess, ministry, if you want to call it like that, when, where he called fire down from heaven and and God answered, but um, if you recall, what we kind of uh, began to do is kind of jump back and see everything that went in Elijah's life leading up to that situation. And, and, and this lesson tonight is, is a good example of that. It's, it's looking into what kind of prepared him uh, for the situation that he was in. And I'll be honest, I, I never really kind of went back and, and or I've never really kind of jumped in this pr part of it as far as where Elijah came from and what all that meant and the situation that he was in as far as leading up. But it's very, very interesting. And I, I do hope tonight that it'll we'll, we'll say some things that'll be a blessing to you. So we're on page 32. And uh, the title of this is The Process of Preparation. Uh, the little clip uh, is 1 Kings chapter 17, the first part of verse number one. It says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead. So so we're, we're kind of beginning to look at where Elijah came from and, and what made him the man that he was and, and to be able to be used by God. So uh, the first part is just kind of a um, little story that the, that the writer is, is kind of uh, telling us. It's kind of going to lead up to a few things. So uh, Miss Melody, would you um, read for us tonight? Maybe um, up till we get to um, uh, the question on page 33, if you don't mind. Shauna is one of my dearest friends, a beautiful ray of sunlight in my life. She's honest, she's cheerful, she's generous, she's real. Whenever I see her, I can't help smiling from ear to ear. As a licensed counselor, she's the kind of person who can minister to people from all walks of life about a myriad of issues and concerns. We've known each other a long time and basically raised our children together, offering advice back and forth to one another through their toddler and teenage years. Her oldest, Joshua, is now a cadet at West Point. Her middle child, daughter, Elena, graduated as valedictorian of her high school class, and her youngest, Noah, is a bright, handsome, soft-spoken middle schooler whose smile, I promise, would light up your whole life. But before these three came along, Shauna and her husband endured the tormenting grief of having to bury their first two children. With each pregnancy, the doctor prescribed long skits of bed rest in order to keep the baby protected in her womb. Yet each time she delivered them both early. They were too small, too weak to survive on their own. So she held them and wept over them, watching them take their first and last Takata breaths. First it was Grace, and then it was Caleb. It was never anything but heartbreaking. Why would the Lord allow this? I don't know. But I can tell you this. Whenever I see Shauna speaking to a young woman whose heart has been broken by the loss of a child, when I see her folding that woman's trembling hands inside her own, that's when I see her living in the sweet spot of her ministry and effectiveness. Does it negate the pain, grief, and hardship that she and her husband face? Would they want to live through it again and wish it on anyone else? Absolutely not. 
but seeing God redeem it this way, funneling it into heartfelt, compassionate ministry to others, does reframe their loss, losses and give their grief purpose. My friend has been prepared for these kinds of ministry moments, prepared by what she's been through, prepared by where she's come from. This same sense of purpose and process is one of the undercurrents of Elijah's example. This right here is a very good story as far as um, how God can use something. Um, you know, as I was thinking, I almost stopped Melody as, after she read that first, those first two paragraphs. Those first two paragraphs were just a perfect example of, of where somebody could be. Everything's going right in their life, and then all of a sudden you see where they came from. You saw, you know, just because everything seems to be great right now doesn't mean that somebody has always had those things or never faced disappointment and, and, and things like that. But I, I can see that. I, I can see that in my own life. I, can, I know many of you can see that in your life as well, uh, where it, it may seem like everything is good right now, but you don't really understand where we've come from. You don't really understand where we've been. And uh, that, that's a good example as far as leading into the life of Elijah. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, the people that God used in the Bible and the people that God is, 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 is using now, they, they've always had it good. They've always had it, uh, just everything handed to them. But that's not always the case. And rarely, really, I, I, I probably need to say rarely is it ever the case that everything goes great in a person's life. But um, you, you think about this. I, just, just hearing this story kind of spoke to me and it kind of made me realize, uh, you know, that, that God takes and uses bad things that happen in our life for, if you want to say, for a greater good or if you want to say to help everybody else out. You think about this, this lady that she's talking about uh, that's named Shauna. She, she's able, no telling how many people she's had an impact on, on being able to sit down with them and talk to them and encourage them and say, you know what, I've been there. Uh, so, some of the things that gets under my skin a lot of times is when these people, whether they're in church or outside of church, try to tell you how you need to accept things and how you need to deal with things, and they've never been through those things. There's been times in my life people have tried to say, well, you, you know, you're just going to have to get over it or you're just going to have to get better or you're going to have to just move forward. And they've never experienced the things that maybe I've been through or somebody else has been through. But when you know somebody has went through the exact same thing and they sit down and they say, I know where you've been. I understand what you've been going through. That, that, that relates a whole lot better to encourage somebody and, and basically to have a ministry. Um, you know, just because you're not behind a pulpit or, or not doing certain things maybe in a church does not mean that you don't have a ministry. The situation that you've been through can, can be your ministry. And as we look at Elijah tonight, we're going to kind of dive into where he came from and, and the process that God put him through uh, to really get to the point where he was able to use Elijah. And really, uh, we're going to start tonight in 1 Kings chapter 17. And it says uh, here, this is the first mention of the prophet in Scripture. And while we don't learn a lot about his background from the opening verse, we at least learn this. The, the first verse of 1 Kings chapter 17, um, I need to get to chapter 17. I was in the, the beginning of 1 Kings. But 1 Kings chapter 17, the very first verse says this, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. You think about it, the first time that he's really came on the scene, you know what he's talking He's talking to the king of Israel. He, he has got boldness already about him and Elijah is prophesying and, and and we know that Elijah was one of the prophets he was one of the uh, the the great prophets that God used in so many different ways but as he's coming on the scene we all we really know as far as his background is where he came from and all of a sudden he he comes on the scene and and he's talking directly to the king so so first of all it says Elijah was a what Tishbite. Uh, his hometown was of the area called 
Gilead. And it says his first allegiance was to who? The Lord God of Israel. That right there in itself is probably, uh, really speaks volume about who he gave his allegiance to, who, who he was faithful to, and who he was uh, really speaking after. And, and, and really, you, you think about it, he, he's, he's saying here in the very first verse of this chapter, he's not saying these are my thoughts or this is what I'm thinking or I'm going to predict that these things are coming. He says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. And, and, and basically, he's saying this is what God has ordained. This is what God's speaking. That's what a prophet of God is. It's not speaking your ideas or your thoughts or your opinions, but it's speaking what God has said. It says the exact location of Tishba, despite being home of one of the greatest figures in all of the Bible, cannot really be identified. Geologists and archaeologists have never been able to pinpoint it with any degree of accuracy. But Gilead comes with a bit more documentation. For the first time in our study, I want you to turn to the map that I provided in the back of the, of the inside back cover. Take a moment and survey it, making mental note of the places you are about as well as ones you've completely uh, unfamiliar with. And it says, now look specifically at the area known as Gilead, east of the Jordan River. It actually shows up in the Bible on quite a few occasions. So in the back of our book, there is a map um, as far as the land of Gilead. And, and uh, Gilead is, is not really a, 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 a what you would call a city. I would think that Jerusalem and Jericho and Bethlehem and all of those are cities. But Gilead is more of a... Uh, 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 I guess you would call it a land or a a a a a, a, a place there that that basically uh, uh, has cities in it. So Tishba is basically a city in the land of Gilead. And you look, it, it's kind of I guess you'd say northeast of Jericho, uh, northeast of Jerusalem. So you you look at this is where uh, Elijah is coming from. So, so that kind of gives you an idea, uh, and it really, when we look at this, a lot of the things that we read about, we read about Nazareth, we read about Capernaum, Jerusalem, so it kind of gives you an idea of where all of these are located. It's all in the same vicinity, but it, it, it is kind of spread out in Israel, so that gives you an idea of, of where Elijah is coming from. From each of the following references, what interesting fact or happening can you connect with Gilead? So I want us to read, and I want to get different people to read this scripture, and I want you to think about what's happening right here. Uh, long before Elijah came on the scene, uh, what, what is happening in, in this so-called land of Gilead. So the first one is Genesis chapter 31, verses 17 through 21. Do you happen to have that, uh, Neil? Yes. And Shane, if you want to read Genesis 37, if you can do that. Deuteronomy 34. Cole, 1 through 4. 17 through 21. So I want you to, as he reads this, I want you to think about what's happening here in the land of Gilead. And then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels. And he drove all his livestock ahead of him. Along with the goods he had accumulated, had Aaron to God to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear sheep, Rachel sold her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Armenian, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, crossing the river, he headed for the hill country of Gilead. So this right here, long before Elijah was ever even thought of, long before you know we had gotten to this first kings and all of this, this this was back when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going on, and and Jacob had had basically found his wives in Laban's house, the things that were going on, and 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 this scripture is basically telling us that he is fleeing from from his father-in-law, he's fleeing from Laban. And he's going into the hill country of Gilead. So it kind of gives us a little bit of a picture. Basically, in my mind, what he's doing, he's going east. He's going over to the land of Gilead. He's fleeing from his father-in-law. And it also tells us the, the, the mountain area uh, of Gilead. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of, of what kind of country um, this, this is, is, is really 
um, um, possessed of. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 23 through 25, Shane. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And that, I'm sorry, I can't say. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. You see, we, we think a lot of times, you know, we, we know Bethlehem, we know Jericho, we know all of these, but, but really it's interesting, all of these things that's kind of being tied to Gilead. Um, you know, Jacob fled there. Jacob went there uh, when he was fleeing from Laban, but then now all of a sudden... Jacob's son Joseph is, is about to be sold to people that's coming from Gilead. So, so it, it, it's it's all of this. There, there's so many connections with this land, and and you know this is probably just three instances that we're going to look at tonight. But but there's there's probably multiple instances where the land of Gilead is somewhat connected. So we know here that that Shane read the the Joseph. You know, think about the impact that Joseph had on the land of Egypt. He, he came to be the second in charge of all of Egypt. He came to, to, to oversee uh, basically the, the seven years of Plinius and, and the seven years of famine. He, he, he basically saved a lot of people back in that day because he listened to what God said. And it all started when his, his, his brother sold him. Uh, to people that were coming from the land of Gilead. So the, the third scripture is Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. So we're going to hear about Moses. Okay. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, of palm trees as far as door. And the Lord said to him, This is the land to which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. The, if, if you're not familiar with this scripture, what is basically happening is this is a little bit before God leads the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Um, you know, we know that Moses, he, he led them out of Egypt. He led them um, through the Red Sea. He led them in, the, in, in the, the wilderness for 40 years, but he disobeyed God. There was some disobedience that was happening, and basically what God did, he said, I'm going to take you up to this mountain. Basically, you're about to die. Um, you know, it, it, it's amazing how things work out back then compared to today, you know. Rarely does probably God ever tell us, okay, you're about to die, and, and this is what I'm about to do with you. But but Moses, he led him up to this mountain, and even though God wasn't going to allow him to enter in because of his disobedience, think about the grace that God showed him. He said, I want you to be able to see the land. I want you to be able to see what I promised. I want you to be able to see the land of, land of Gilead was one of the lands that he was able to take up when he was on that mountain. He was able to look on the other side and see all of this um, right there. And, and, and basically Moses was, was uh, at the top of the mountain. It was right before his death. And, and he got to see all the things that God had, uh, had, had promised. So we, we got a little idea of what this land of Gilead is all about. We know it's a mountainous land. We know there's connections between between Jacob, Joseph, different things like that. And, and then all of a sudden now we know that there is a connection with Elijah as well. So on page 34, um, uh, uh, Neil, would you like to, to read that? Page 34. Let's break that book in tonight. Yeah, no way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Gilead was hill country covered with dense forest and wild undergrowth. It was remote and uncivilized. Even its name, Gilead, means rocky or rugged. That's where Elijah was from, and that's who Elijah was. A mountain man, a tough, adventurous, free-ranging spirit. Picture him with 
calloused hands and chipped, grubby fingernails. Picture him in scratchy, burlap quality clothes. Picture his skin tanned and leathery, a thick and gnarly beard around his chin. His head topped by a matted stack of, I don't know what that word, tassel? Yes, unruly hair. Elijah was grooming <laughs> in the sophisticated manners and etiquette of the city. Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah wasn't grooming in the sophisticated manners and etiquette of the city. Elijah lacked classical education and social polish. His verbs and nouns didn't always agree. He wasn't brought up in the echelons of society where he could earn the kind of credentials and connections that paved his way to success. Scholars believe he likely tended sheep on the heights of those lonely, uneven hillsides in Gilead. It's where he learned to value and endure in the stretches of solitude and silence. It's where he had time to grow into a muscular, sony man, scenic, sony man with tenacity. It took to stave off predators and provide for his flocks. Elijah came from a hard place, a rough place, an obscure place, the right place to be prepared for what God had in store for him. I don't know about you, but in my mind, I probably did a picture of Elijah quite like this. Um, you know, I... I guess in a way, when I when I read the Bible, I, I try to picture things, and, and this probably wasn't what I pictured from Elijah. Um, you know, we, we talked about, and I preached a little bit this morning about Paul, and you, things that were said about Paul is he grew up religious, and, and, you know, he was a Pharisee, and he had all of these things in order, and, and, and back in that day, I, I would probably picture him as, as clean cut or, or, you know, the, the, I don't know if you could really say clean cut back then because they didn't have razors and probably all those things like that. But for the most part, he was a religious person. And, you know, when I, when I picture that, I, I picture it being somewhat clean and somewhat, um, you know, got, you know, maybe some money or, or things like that. He had everything going for him, but it was the exact opposite with Elijah. Elijah came from a place that was rough. A place that was hard, and you know, me and me and Cole watched these like living off the grid and and th th this kind of stuff that that I really like. I, I like live. I like the the thought of that and and stuff. And some of those people, they rough it. They 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 are different than us. They uh, the, you know, some of them they don't make the best choices. They'll go out in the remote areas and not have all this stuff planned out. And, and, and they are roughing it. They're in a bad situation. And, and things are not easy for them. And that's kind of like Elijah was. You know, Gilead was a place that probably didn't just have all the stores that you could run down to and, and maybe get some groceries or this or that. You know, he had to work and he had to um, probably kill things to eat. And he had to uh, uh, maybe hide in caves. He had to uh, make all of these decisions just because of the country that he was coming up in. And what I'm trying to say is, is, is he wasn't handed a silver platter. He, he came from some hard times and God was using him during those times. And, and, and if that's not a perfect example of, of how God can work in our life, just because there's something bad that's happened in our life or that we've been through or maybe where we're at right now does not mean God cannot bring us out and use us on the other side. Uh, the, the example that Elijah gives us is, is an example that we ought to take to heart that, that God can do things in our heart just like he did Elijah. The way that God was able to use Elijah wasn't just because God said, you know, is there anybody that, that, that wants me to use them? He had a plan and he had purpose in Elijah's life and, and he led him to the place that he needed to, to be at. So, so thinking about all of this, uh, there's kind of a question or a, a, a thought process right here. It says, think back to an earlier season in your life that perhaps was marked by hardship, challenge, loneliness, or obscurity. Record a few key words below that describes or that describe a, that season for you. So think about a time that maybe you were in a place where you felt all alone or a place that was trying, a place that was hard. And, and what's some things that, that you went through during that time? One of the words I put was tired. Like just kind of emotionally tired. <laughs> because of the stuff you've been through.
it's hard. You know, when you go through something, and 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 my hard may not be your hard. You know, uh, your hard might be something dealing with with somebody in your family or or you know things that you've been through. A lot of people go through things in their marriages. A lot of people go through things with their kids. A lot of people go through things with their parents and 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 things that are that are just hard to deal with. You know, I I, I know my my mom. Um, you know, over the last probably seven years, she's lost her dad and lost her mom. And, and her, her mom, uh, my grandmother, she had dementia. And it, 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 was, it was hard to deal with. You know, she tried, to, she tried to keep her at the house as long as she could. We would check on her and we had to have people live with her. And finally she went to the nursing home. And, and, it, and it's hard looking at somebody like that and somebody that you love that to go through things so we 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 have all been through something you know it's not all the same you know what i've been through you haven't what you've been through maybe i have and and, and there's so many things but you look at where where these words come from they're they're basically what it means is is somebody was struggling Somebody was going through some hard times, and, and some of mine was the same thing. I put uncertainty. I put fear. I put humble. You know, when you think about it, if anything will humble you is when something's out of control in your life. <laughs> You'll say, you know what, God, I, I, I'm, I'm not even close to where I need to be. God, I need to humble myself before you, and I need to seek your face. But I also put faith, and I put hope for a better day. I can I can remember times in my life where I didn't even want to get out of bed in the morning times, and 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 in my mind it, it was struggle and it was it was worry and it was doubt and all of these things. But in my mind I, I was also thinking I sure hope a better day's coming. You know I hope something is is going to get better. So so even during those times, just because we have heartaches and we have all these negative thoughts and feelings, doesn't mean that we can't have a little bit. Uh, 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 of almost hope that something else is going to uh, going to uh, be better for us. It says this: Have you ever questioned why God allowed you to go through that season or to experience that difficulty? How so? Anybody got a testimony about that? I would kind of say that, like hindsight is twenty twenty. So, like now, I don't really question it. Why it happened, mm -hmm. but it was you know less so that way at the time. Mm -hmm. There's been times in my life I have I have wondered, God, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? I mean, I be I, there's times in my life I, that 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 I can remember, you know, something that happened in my life, and and I was telling God, I said, God, I, I was I was reading my Bible every day. <laughs> I mean, I, I was telling, look, I was reading, I was, I was, I was close to you. I was where you wanted me to be, and you allowed this to happen in my life. You know, I, I, I have, I have questioned God, and I, I hate to even say this. I, I've questioned God, why, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? But like Cole is saying, now I can look back and I can understand. You know what? God used that. God made me stronger by that. God is allowing me to, to maybe help somebody else out because of what I've been through. So like she said, you know, hindsight is 2020. We don't always understand it right then, but God always brings it to pass and lets us see, okay, I can still use you even though something happened in your life. And, and it's really just a testimony of, uh, of the grace and the mercy of God that that nothing is too big that God can't bring us through and use something in our life. Anybody else got anything about that? Okay, on page 35 it says, Looking at those experiences now from your current vantage point, how have, you he how have they helped shape the way you think and feel about Him today? Yeah. 
done nothing for you. I've been nothing but a stunt for Clark. I've done nothing but spread ill intent. But you allowed me to stay. Blows my mind. That's the kind of thing I look at. I don't know. That stuff I've done in my life. I don't know why I'm still here. Why'd you leave me? Yep. Mm. So gracious. So merciful. That's right. Anybody else? I put, I've seen how he provided and worked things out. Amen. You know, just, it, it's almost like, you know, just as God led Moses up to that mountaintop to see what was in front of him, every once in a while he leads us to a mountaintop that we can look back and say, look where, look where he came and he brought us from. Amen. You know, I, I can look now and say, you know what, my life is so much better right now than it was, let's say, five years ago. You know, and, and and maybe that five years, it, it was tough going through certain things and doing certain things and 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 refraining from certain things and, and, and trying to trying to do what you know I thought God was calling me to do. And you know, you look back and you see maybe you question so many times was God really there for me at that particular time and we look back and he was there the whole time. You know, every time, and I put also, I've seen his faithfulness. Um, I, I've seen how he's been faithful even when I haven't been. When I when I was, you know, squalling in the bed or you know kicking my feet, not wanting to go or do something, you know, it it was God that was faithful. Um, you know, I, I think about my. It seems like my grandmother used to have that picture about the the, the footprints in the sand, and and you've probably all seen it and. And it, you know, the, the basically the poem is saying, you know, look at how many, look at how much I've I've walked, and you wasn't walking beside me. And in the end, we find out that it was God's footprints, and He was carrying us. You know, I, I think a lot of times, probably in our life, if we were to look at that, there would probably be some footprints and a drag mark, Him dragging us. Uh, you know, to, to say you're going to get to this place, and, and 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 when we look back on these these prophets and different ones like that in the Bible. You know, it, don't just think, okay, everything was great and, and it just worked out and, and they did it. You know, you, you think about, you know, Jonah. Jonah, God told him to go down there and, and prophesy and, 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 and preach and do all those things. And he said, I'm not doing it. And, and come to find out, he had a change of heart because of um, God, God basically did the dragging a little bit to, to get him to, to change his mind. So... When we look at all this, we got to realize, you know, there there are things that happen in their life. So, anything else anybody want to wants to mention about that? Just like acceptance and you know, a real huge lesson in patience. Mm -hmm. You know, with my illness that's going on twenty plus years, so many times, you know, I went to ask. Why, why, why aren't I healed? Why aren't I better? Why aren't I, you know, why do I have to live every single day with, you know, pain and some sort of something that goes on every day? But I just had to accept this is, this is what you have for me. I have to accept it. I have to have patience through all of these things. So, and still be faithful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is and it's his, hard. This is his plan for me. And I just have to accept that. So, and, and I have learned to do that. Some days are easier than others. Some days are harder than others. But yeah, you still have to accept that. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else now? All right. Would you mind reading mm -hmm. on page thirty-five the start of the various events? The various events and circumstances that have contributed to your life up until the, up until this point have not been accidental. They've not been wasted, parts of your process, even if they are difficult, even if they excluded you from certain privileges that in your estimation could have propelled you forward faster. Even the evil that's been done against you by people who intended you harm has not been a total loss. This doesn't excuse their wrongdoing, of course. It doesn't minimize the real pain they caused you, but it does add a layer of perspective and hope. As Joseph could say, after being wrongfully treated by his brothers, after being unjustly enslaved and imprisoned in Egypt, God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. And we can skip to 20. For Elijah, the fact that he was raised in an uncouth environment, the fact that he wasn't brought up around more urban, urban culture, taste, and people, the fact that he grew up at a distance from Africa, the fact that he had no lineage or pedigree, even worth me 
just hearing that and the perspective that she's coming from as far as the way she's painting what Elijah was, you know, it, it jumps out to me that, that um, the part, he didn't have any lineage, he didn't have any pedigree. Um, it, it, it wasn't like Paul that we talked about this morning that was of the house of, you know, Benjamin that was uh, Israelite, all of these different things. He didn't, Elijah didn't have all of this. But you look at what, what God was doing. God was taking a man that was sheltered, one that was excluded from all of society. And, and, and basically the reason that he was able to do this and able to use Elijah because of all the things that were going on were basically idols. Were, it was idolatrous worship. It was things that society had been involved in. And, and to, to me, it's almost an example of today, you know, these bigger cities that, that are grouped together. It's more of, let's go with the flow. Let's do what everybody else is doing. All of these things are right. And, and you know, I'm thankful that I live kind of out in the country. You know, a lot of these people that I work with, you know, they live around Hoover, live around here or there. And, you know, um, you know, people ask me, where, where do you live? Well, I live in Jefferson. I live, you know, 45 minutes south of Hoover. And, oh, yeah, that, that's some say, well, that's on out there. And that's this and that. But, but you know, the, the, the closer you get to what you want to call the in crowd, sometimes it can have an influence on on, on how you live, on how you stand, on how you, um, you know, maybe are used by God. So, so what God was doing, God was taking somebody that, that, that was way out there that wasn't to the point of this idolatrous worship that wasn't part of that, but it was somebody that he was using. And it, and it, it kind of reminded me a lot of, of David. You know, David was out in the you want to say the hill country or the pastures whatever he was tending to the sheep he was he was kind of out there doing his own thing at, but even during that time God was using him and God was molding him into what he wanted to be and and uh, I, I just I just like the picture of, of what she does um, about Elijah it was somebody I know uh, Melody read and I can't really find it right now where he wasn't influenced by what others thought you know he knew God's Power. He knew God's faithfulness. He knew how, where God had brought him from. And, and he came on the scene and he wasn't worried. He was standing in front of King Ahab telling him, um, you, you know, about basically what God had, had prophesied and what God was about to do. You know, he didn't care about what King Ahab thought about. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like Ahab wasn't his king. He had a greater king than that. And, and that's kind of how we need to be. I'm not saying that we need to uh, just always be in disobedience to the law or things like that, but 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 with our allegiance, you know, it kind of goes back to, to, to the first part of, of this lesson is Elijah's first allegiance was to God, and he let everything else fall into place. So so that, that that's really a good way to look at it. On page 36, says, thinking back again to some of those uh, uh, situations and experiences God has uh, taken you through, how would you be less committed today, have less clarity on your purpose, or be less assured in adversity if those occurrences had not been part of your past, of your preparation, of your process? What would you like if you hadn't experienced them? That, that is, that's some serious stuff for us to think about tonight. Where would we be if we hadn't been through those bad places? I, I, I'll be honest. I don't know that I would have as much faith in God right now if I hadn't been through some of those bad things. Because during those bad things, I saw the faithfulness of God. I know that I prayed for certain things and God came through for me. For me. I know that God promised me certain things and I had to sit back and I had to realize, okay, it may not happen right now, but God's going to do this. And I've seen him be faithful through it all. So I'm, I'm sorry for kind of answering that question, but what, what are your thoughts on that? How would you be um, less committed today? How would you have less clarity on your purpose? How would you be less assured in adversity if all of those things hadn't happened in your life? Well, we're sinful by nature. Mm -hmm. The day we get here, we're, we're sinful. So sometimes it's kind of like Shane alluded to, uh, we make bad decisions. I mean, we make decisions on our 
wrong. So sometimes the the hard times, the troubles that we, we get into are substitute. Well, if, if we're the clay and he's the, he's the potter, then as we go through these hard times, he's shaping us and forming us into the person and our walk should grow stronger because he reveals himself to us. So because of the the, the trials that we endure, uh, we should have a closer walk and better understanding of his purpose for our life. That's right. Anybody else? I put I would be less experienced. Absolutely. I wouldn't have went through the things that I that I am now able to help people with. You know, I'm able to help people now or talk to people at times because it, it's kind of like what I've shared. I, I've when when you talk to somebody that's been through it, you you can relate. You can get through to somebody. You know, the the last person like if, if somebody is involved with with you know drinking or drugs or something like that, the last person they want to hear is somebody that doesn't have a problem with drinking, that doesn't have a problem with drugs, or never had a problem with drugs. But somebody that could get through to them and help them is somebody that was in the same place they were in, but can tell them how they got out of it. And that, and that's just an example. It, it could go with sexual sins. It could go with you know um, you, you know uh, other kind of addictions, things like that. So I put this. I said your past makes you. You are who you are today because of your past. You know, we, we, we talk about our past. I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to, you know, but, but really we are who we are today because of our past. Um, as much as we hate it, as much as we dread what we've been through or the, like Shane says, the, the stupid decisions that we've made before, we've all made them. You know, I can look back and say, I, I was so stupid on making some of those decisions. And I, I, I was just careless on on maybe sinning or careless on things I was involved in. And and But we can't change it, but we can, you know, we're, we're better people today because God did allow us to get through it. God did show us mercy when he should have struck us dead right then. Um, you know, he, he, he gave us... He gave us hope and he gave us grace and he said, you know what, even though you've made some terrible choices, I still love you and I've still got a purpose for you on down the road. Um, I, you know, somebody, somebody, I think, kind of made the statement one time, I'm, 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 mercy is basically not getting what we deserve. And I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want what I deserve. I don't. I want mercy. I, I want grace. Um, I don't deserve it, but I, I sure do want it, and God's uh, definitely willing to to give it to us. Um, in the in the uh, in the little um, to the left over here on on page thirty six, it, it says Psalm one nineteen seventy one through seventy three. It says, "It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your hands made me and fashioned me." Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. The first part said is it was good that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. The bad things we go through has a purpose, and it's to, 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 for us to be better, uh, to get better for God. So um, anybody else got anything about that?
Um, Cynthia, I'm not trying to call you out, but is everything okay? Okay. If if you need us to stop and have special prayer for anything, you let us know. We're we're almost done. So um, if and if you need if you need anything, let us know. So, um, so let's read on page 36 the, the bottom part of that and, and into 37, and we're, we're about to wrap it up anyway, but it, it adds a little bit more, um, I, I guess, um, outlook on Elijah, where he came from, and, um, and, and kind of relates to us too. So would, would you mind reading it? <laughs> During Elijah's unrecorded years in Gilead, he somehow came to know, to really know Yahweh. Maybe it was his father or mother who taught him the record of God's faithfulness to Israel. Maybe some of the older shepherds he worked around were in the habit of pointing out God's living, active, moving presence among them in Gilead. Maybe it was in the quietness of performing his everyday shepherding tasks that Elijah sensed God supernaturally revealing himself to his soon-to-be representatives. One way or another, while doing his tedious, mundane, lonesome work, while facing hardships, we'll never know, Elijah has been exposed to influences that convinced him Jehovah wasn't just one deity among many other options. He developed a deep knowledge, reverence, and understanding for Yahweh's covenant with his people, a holy perspective that would form the basis for his first prophetic declaration in Scripture. This God, Israel's God, was a jealous God who had no intention of sharing his gospel with man-made idols. That's what Elijah learned in Gilead. In Gilead, where he was from. In Gilead, where his heart was formed. In Gilead, where his own personal <coughs> trials and difficulties became the start of a process. A process of living and thinking and navigating his journey by faith. The backside of that raw, rugged desert was God's way of bringing Elijah around to know him in a way he would, he would never have experienced him otherwise. Now he was ready to declare God's word with boldness and authority. Elijah's whole life was about to become a clear, bold declaration of God's power and provision. And so is yours. Where you have come from, what have you been through? All of it has been preparing you for the purpose he's planned next for you. Think about that. Um, you know, where he came from was was of no significance, really. As like I said, I, I've never really studied his background. You know, but but we see in scripture, you know, how Abraham he had a, um, Isaac. How Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had sons, and he had Joseph, and and it was trickling down, and and all of them could go back and say, you know, I was connected to Abraham, I was connected to Isaac, I was connected to Jacob, and 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 it's important in the Old Testament they used that lineage um, as as a significant standing in society, in society, and even Jews today, I mean, they they can trace their lineage and we I think we talked about it this morning with Paul you know that he was able to trace his lineage back to the to the house of I think Benjamin I think it was and uh, you know that he was an Israelite and all of these things and and then you look at Elijah you know in in our mind Elijah's dad had no significance you know and it's hard to say that because you know, Elijah was greatly used by God and, and all of that, but but to my knowledge, I don't know, I don't know that it ever really talked about Elijah's dad. You know, Elijah's dad wasn't like Abraham. Elijah's dad wasn't like uh, Jacob or Joseph or any of those. But look at what look at how God used him. You know, almost like you don't have to be of a certain thing. You don't have to be of a certain household. For God to, to use you, and, and God used Elijah greatly. God did a lot of things in Elijah's life, and and and, and we know the story of uh, one day how Elisha comes on the scene, and, and he, you know, it was kind of a, a continuation of Elijah and things like that, and, and but God used Elijah greatly, and he, he didn't have those credentials. He didn't have those, okay, I've been to seminary, or I've been to 
uh, this kind of school or I've got this kind of knowledge. I mean, God was showing him firsthand knowledge. God was showing him, you know, how to, to make it on his own. You know, there's no telling how many sermons God was giving him or how many prophecies that God was giving him and getting him ready uh, for him to come on the scene. So just because we don't have certain credentials or certain qualifications doesn't mean God can't use us. God can use whoever he wants to. Somebody like me, somebody like you, God can use. So that gives me hope tonight. That gives me a, a hope that, that no matter what I've gone through or what I'm going through, that, that God has a plan and God has a purpose uh, for our lives. I, you will hear me say it over and over and over, probably to the point where y'all get tired of hearing it, but, but he does. He has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. He wants to use everyone that's in this congregation, uh, whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever the case is, God wants to use us. And that's what he did. He, he used Elijah. Elijah came on the scene. Nobody really knew where he come from. Nobody knew really what, what his credentials were. He didn't really even have any. But, but he came on the scene, and, 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 and he came on the scene hot and heavy. Um, you know, God prepared him. However long it was, I, I'm not sure how old Elijah was when he came on the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17, but, but he come on and he was wide open for God. And uh, so, so just because you're going through something doesn't mean God's not going to use you. And it says this, as you close today's lesson, take a few moments to thank the Lord for your journey this far. Ask him to give you the courage to trust that he is using every part of it, even the difficult and despairing parts to form you into his image, to focus your passions and pursuits, and to funnel you into the stream of his purposes for, his, for this generation, for future generations. So, you know, we ought to thank God for where he has brought us from, the things that we have went through, because we are who we are today because of those things. And, and like I say, you know, we never know what kind of impact we're going to have on other people just because of what the things we've been through. So just keep that in mind. That's the end of that lesson. I told Cole, I think yesterday, I said, I think we're going to be able to finish this lesson. This is a little bit easier than the, the one prior to that. We had to divide it up. There was a lot of stuff in that one. So this one was kind of definitely, and ho hopefully we didn't take, take too much longer than, than, than normal. But uh, it's good kind of get through that. And that way, um, I guess it'll be four weeks from tonight is when we'll have our next Bible study and we'll talk about, uh, we'll be on day five, Elijah's calling. So um, definitely uh, keep this in mind. Try, try to read over um, this lesson before we have it again. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, two weeks from tonight too. Um, uh, Gracie, y'all weren't here this morning, but we're going to have a ice cream supper type thing, kind of as a back to school type thing. We're going to uh, maybe just share a little devotion and, and uh, do um, ice cream, things like that. So uh, I know the kids and, and hopefully us as adults will like it too. So I need some ice cream. Next Bible study on the 29th. That sounds about right. I left my phone. That's why it's Okay. That works. Yeah, because, because I think August has five Sundays. So yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that sounds good. So, so Gracie, bring friends. Yep. Do you have friends? Yes, I have friends. She acts like she don't. She acts all pitiful. I have a school. I have friends. Well, I don't know. I have guy friends. You do? Oh, uh, wow. Well, one of them's your cousin, so he don't have. Don't be talking about this in church. Get my You're asking me. What did he say? He said it's Alabama. <laughs> Anything we need to make mention of before we dismiss tonight? All right, I think we got some sandwiches that we want you to partake of tonight, and uh, looking forward to the fellowship too. Um, you know, a lot of things that we covered this morning in the uh, business meeting. Let's let's be thinking about that. Don't, don't um, that. That's right. Yeah. Um, the get-togethers, um, fish fries, things like that, uh, definitely um, is something that we need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Especially once it gets cooling off and stuff. I mean, whether it's at somebody's house or here, you know, having a good fish fry and 
things like that. If you involve food, I think we will definitely get together. So, <laughs> so let, let's definitely be praying for that. Um, um, just kind of make mention, me and Cole, and I think um, Shane and Cynthia rode by that church today just to kind of look at it. Um, it looks like somebody's kind of occupying it at the, at the moment as far as probably written it out, or maybe they just said, if y'all want to meet here until it sells, you know, things like that. So um, she couldn't find where it was posted, and they may not technically post it. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how you go about selling the church. Well, anyway, I wonder so. if we could contact whoever told Debbie that. Yeah, we, we can probably maybe find out just this week how much. I have no idea. I don't mind cold calling. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 like I said, I'm not pushing it either way, but I, I would like to know, you know, just kind I mean, of. I'm just curious. Yeah. And it, 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 it may be more than we want to even buy it off or even think about. So, but um, just having an idea is, is not a bad thing. So we'll, we'll try to figure that out, and maybe we can maybe briefly talk about it next Sunday. So. Sure would be nice to have somewhere to call home. Uh -huh. Yeah. It would. <coughs> it would. It would. Um, but, you know. I don't think I'd really consider it. I was telling Heath if the parsonage wasn't there and that was an income generator. Just because, well, based on the price. Because, I mean, just yeah, even in our personal life, like we hate payments. You could, you could take it, that parsonage, and bring it Church van? Yeah. They may be bigger than us, I don't know. I just want to say it. We were riding around. This place is inhabited. Well, I saw the sign. I, was, I saw the sign and I thought, well, it's going to say Jimson Church of God. Yeah. And it says something about living waters or something. Uh, yeah, CCW. I, I don't know. The Church of God sign, if you go on past the four way, it's right there. Jimson Church of God sign. Okay. I thought we were in the wrong spot there for a second. Well, Cole's like, turn in. I said, there's cars there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not. Uh, right after we left here. Uh, straight up. Uh, 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 